Okay, next we're going to have uh, JJ Bola, my friend JJ Bola. And then we're going to have a little break, and then we're going to have uh, Glenn from Liberate Tate and David Grabo, who's like an anthropologist type guy. Uh, <laughs> on about. So, JJ, yeah, JJ, JJ is my, he's a, he's a poet, he's a, um, uh, he, uh, he's a refugee from Congo. Hey, JJ. Hello, how's everyone doing? You good? Let's get the energy up a bit. You good? Yeah. You know, if there's a revolution to be happening, we need to have energy for it. Firstly, I have to apologize for wearing my jacket indoors. My mum would be angry at me, but it's ridiculously cold. I was born in a climate um, 100 kilometers away from the equatorial line, which has an average uh, temperature of 32 degrees. So adjusting to Britain, even though I've been here for over 20 years, has been a little bit difficult. Um, so. I'm gonna speak a little bit or rant a little bit um, about culture is not your friend and also I'm gonna do some performance. I am a poet, performance poet, a writer, um, spoken word artist, uh, a human being essentially, despite what the oppressive hegemony might try and say. And I guess um, in regards to culture is not your friend. Um, those of us who have read or seen the Terence McKenna talk, um, firstly what we have to ask is whose culture? So is it the culture of the privilege? Is it the culture of hegemony? Is it the mainstream culture? Or is it the culture of the oppressed? And those are two things that are diametrically opposed. Initially, um, the culture of the mainstream is definitely not your friend. It is your poison, it is what oppresses you. Because mainstream culture, mainstream culture to teaches you to be consumers, to be capitalists, to want more and more and more, and to essentially destroy. So we live in a society that is very consumptive. How many of us here have mobile phones and, and laptops and so on, and all these technological things that really destroy our life uh, and our resources. I come from Congo, and a lot of us, many of us here, may or may not be aware about the um, mineral conflict that's happening in regards to Congo. So all our modern technology, all our smartphones, and everything that we, we are in possession of, it's, a lot of it is taken from that, and it's been fueled, it's fueled a conflict that's happened for, and it's lasted over 17 years now. So it's something that we need to be conscious of is whose culture are we following? Now the culture of the privilege is not, is not your friend, yes, but the culture of the press, of the oppressed, is one of resistance. If we look at hip hop, for, for instance, how many of us here are into, into hip hop? Yeah? yeah? You need to hop hip hop heads in the house? No? Okay, we might be, but we might, we, might, we might not. But also, if we look into hip hop, it came from the most poorest, desegregated neighborhoods in America, the most oppressed. And what's happening to hip hop now? Essentially, what you're seeing in regards to hip hop is it's being culturally appropriated. So it's taken from, uh, uh, it's taken the culture of the oppressed, which was a culture of resistance, resistance against mainstream, re resistance against dehumanization, and it's tried to accommodate it so that people don't understand or don't know the origins of it. It's the same thing that happens with the arts, with literature, with, with music, for instance. How many of us are hearing resistance music on the radios now? We're not, but there once was a time when Bob Marley or Rage, in the, Rage Against the Machine or Public Enemy was played on mainstream radio. Can you just imagine that? Imagine t turning on our radios now and hearing something like Public Enemy and Fight the Power on the radio. I think I'd have a heart attack. I, I don't know, that's just me. Maybe you guys will find it normal. I don't know. Um, but that's just a, a, it's just something for us to think about. Um, one other example about how resistance is really powerful and cultural resistance. Um, how, many of us, how many of us are aware of um, the former MP for Tottenham, Bernie Grant? Yeah? Bernie Grant was an amazing man. You know, I was barely even alive when you know, he became MP for Tottenham. You met him. There you go. Something I was not privileged enough to do. Exactly. And one of the things about Bernie Grant that really, really um, kind of surprised me was when he was first elected as MP for Tottenham, in the when he went to the Houses of Parliament, he was dressed in an agbada, which is traditional Nigerian attire. And that 
angered so much of the privileged elites. And that was a massive display of cultural resistance. So at any time, if you're part of the oppressed group, as in if you're working class, if you're a refugee, if you're, if you're considered black minority ethnic group, if you're part of the oppressed class, essentially the class that isn't part of the elites, and you are holding on to your culture, then that is one of the strongest forms of a re resistance that we can have. And I think art, literature, poetry, music is a, a fabulous expression of resistance. And for myself, um, so I'm just going to perform a little bit, a bit of poetry. Um, I've campaigned a lot in regards, to, in regards to Congo and raising awareness about the conflict that's been happening back home. My family derived from that and we have experience of that. There's over six million people who have been killed. And a lot of it has been centered around gaining access to resources. And one thing that I noticed is when I campaigned, when I wrote letters to MPs, when I quoted statistics and data, a lot of people took it in, but it didn't really stay with them. However, when I wrote poetry about it, it touched people in a different way that statistics could not. And that is essentially what makes us human, is what makes us continue to have that spirit of resistance regardless of what the mainstream elites might try to force upon us. So if you will bear my ranting just a little bit longer, but this time it will be a little bit more poetic as opposed to scrambled, if you like. Um, I'm going to perform two pieces. Got any, uh, have you got any fans of poetry in the house? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Because it would be really awkward if you weren't. <laughs> um, so the first poem that I'm going to do is called This Is Not Just. And this is a little bit about um, the conflict back home. This is not just another war. Not just another group of rebels fighting without a cause, puppets on a string stealing riches from a nation's poor. This is not just another fight, not another plight of a people as the screams of teenagers echo into the night. We've turned pages in history, gone from dark ages into the light, but this is not just another struggle that we will one day leave behind. Not just another thought in the back of our minds, as long as it doesn't interrupt with our lives, we choose only that which our conscience can bear. We lose our humanity every time we stare at a television, every time we eat in McDonald's, sat by the window seat of a Starbucks with a cappuccino, reading the latest pop book, every time we download an app on our iPhone, iPad, I am alone. This is not just what happens here to the little girl broken to pieces, hiding her tears. Never allow your fears to be greater than your dreams. I rarely cry, but every time I write, I shed streams. This is not just poetry. This is a prayer. This is eyes closed, bending knees, hands together in the air. This is for every struggle in humanity. From the, in, from the Middle East to East Congo, we are not alone. This is not just for me. This is for the homeless person begging on the streets. This is for the single mother, the clinically depressed, the war child, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the daughter of a rape victim. This is for the ones who cry and the ones who hold it all in, the beautiful ones who are not yet born. This is for the ones who will struggle their whole lives and only know scorn. This is to humanity. This is not just. Thank you. This is about my own personal uh, experience as a refugee um, coming into Britain. So uh, my family came to uh, London in 1992 from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And many of you may or may, or may not be familiar with uh, the history of Congo, but we did um, suffer at that time a dictatorial regime of President Mobutu that lasted 32 years. And my family coming out of that into London, for me and a lot of my family, is quite, it was a really difficult time and one that took me a long time growing up to understand the situation, particularly the change of language, change of culture, the change of environment as well. And growing up, I was quite ashamed of that. Didn't really understand because, you know, there was the pressures of having to be like everyone else. 
but now I, I'm more empowered after gaining a lot more knowledge and this just tells a little bit about my experience of that. It's called Refuge. Imagine how it feels to be chased out of home, to have your grip ripped, loosened from your fingertips, something that you so dearly hold onto. Like a lover's hand that slips when pulled away, you are always reaching. My father would speak of home, reaching, speaking of familiar faces, the girl next door who would eventually grow up to be a mother, the fruit seller at the market, the lonely man at the top of the road who nobody spoke to, and our house at the bottom of the street lit up by a single flickering lamp where beyond was only darkness. There, they would sit and tell stories of monsters that lurked and came only at night to catch the children who sat and listened to stories of monsters that lurked. This is how they live. Each memory buried. An artifact left to be discovered by archaeologists, the last words on a dying family member's lips. This was sacred. Not even monsters could taint this. But there were monsters that came during the day. Monsters who tore families apart with their giant hands and fingers that slept on triggers. The sound of gunshots ripping through the sky became familiar at like the tapping of rainfalls on the windowsill. Monsters that would kill and hide behind speeches, suits and tires. Monsters that would chase families away, forcing them to leave everything behind. I remember when we first stepped off the plane. Everything was foreign, unfamiliar uninviting even the air in my lungs left me short of breath we came here to find refuge they called us refugees so we hid ourselves in their language until we sounded just like them changed the way we dressed to look just like them made this our home until we lived just like them and began to speak of familiar faces the girl next door who would eventually grow up to be a mother the fruit seller at the market the lonely man at the top of the road who nobody spoke to and our house at the bottom of the street, lit up by a single flickering lamp where beyond was only darkness. There, we would sit and watch police that lurked and came only at night to catch the youths who sat and watched police that lurked. This is how we lived. I remember one day, I heard them say to me, they come here to take our jobs. They need to go back to where they came from. Not knowing that I was one of the ones who came, I told them, that a refugee is simply someone who is trying to make a home. So next time, when you go to sleep, tuck your children in and kiss your families goodnight. Be glad that the monsters never came for you in their suits and ties, never came for you in the media where the newspaper lies, never came for you, that you are not despised. And deep inside the hearts of each and every single one of us, we are all always reaching for a place that we can call home. Thank you.